Okay, I'm gonna assume that everyone can see my slides, unless anyone says otherwise. So, yeah, looks good, thank you. Perfect. Uh, hi everyone, I'll be talking about my work when I was a PhD student. So I specifically study thermal conductivity um, of silicon and hydroxycatalysis bonds with silicon. And I studied other relevant properties uh, involving silicon as well. So I would, I'll first give you like a brief introduction, then talk about thermal conductivity, silicon, and then hydroxycatalysis bonds. And then if there's time, I'll talk about the strength testing that I did and some FEA simulations that I did on the mirror suspensions. So the first thing to note is for those that hopefully everyone knows, thermal conductivity, it just refers to the intrinsic property um, that material has to transfer to conduct or transfer uh, heat through it. So in this case, as I said before, I'm gonna be talking about silicon, which for everyone knows, uh, there's two materials that we're looking into for the next generation detectors, which are silicon or sapphire. Uh, I'll be focusing on silicon, there's Wei Cheng Zheng. So I'll just do um, thermal conductivity and I can admit him. So maybe you can. Um, so uh, our the material that I'm choosing in this case is silicon. Uh, and one of the reasons that silicon is such a good material is because you can find in large bulks, which you can do so much for sapphire yet. Uh, but for example, Kagra has sapphire and very likely the ET telescope and LIGO will be also doing Sapphire. My sort of focus in here is more to do with the ETLF, so the low frequency one, which will go into cryogenic temperatures. Also one of the reasons for silicon and Sapphire is because the next generation will be looking into cryogenic temperatures. Uh, and these two materials work very well at that time, at that temperature. Whereas at the moment for room temperature, we're still using uh, silica. So we know how silicon works. We know how the bonds work at cool temperatures. There's papers on that. But the thing that we don't really know or we didn't know before was how the bond between silicon bonds and silicon work at low temperatures in the larger scale. Because one of the key things that we want to do or be able to do is extract heat from the mirrors. Uh, so we're not adding extra heat into the system. So as everyone knows, uh, you can see my pointer. Sorry, I'm trying to find my pointer, which is not anywhere. Okay, so imagine I'm pointing to the face of the mirror. So if you have a laser shining on that face, uh, you're essentially depositing heat into the mirror. And one way for the heat to come out is through the ears, which are labeled on the drawing, through, through the ears and out the suspensions. And to do this, the heat has to go through what connects this mass of the mirror to the ears, which is the bond. Um, so uh, we know that silicon also has a linear coefficient of expansion that goes to zero at the cold temperatures. And because of that, so does the thermoelastic thermal noise also goes to zero. I run 120 and 20 Kelvin, which are the two likely temperatures or would be likely temperatures to be used. So a little bit on cryogenics, as I said before, we have a laser. So if you look at the image there, you have a laser shining onto the test mass on the freight on the face at the front. And we need to make sure that this heat is extracted from the mirror and through the suspension fibers. Um, and as I said before, it obviously includes the heat extracted through the connecting points, which are the silicate bonds. So my experiment focused specifically on that, but before I could measure the thermal conductivity of silica and bonds, I had to measure first or have a test mass, a test bed for the experiment. So I first measured silicon, which is a, 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 a material well known and multiple times, many times has been measured by various people. So it's a known material. So I first measured silicon by having a silicon sample, which is that black block that you can see there, although well, it should be more silver, uh, more grayish. But so we essentially had a sample and we had four sensors attached to the sample, which are the T1, T2, T3, and T4 that you can see on the image. And we had little, so this is a very small sample. It's a five by five by 40 mil uh, sample. And we had little sensors connecting through across the sample. So we were measuring the temperature at each point as we apply heat on one side, as you can see from the image, one side, and then the heat will obviously go through the sample and we measure the heat, the temperature at each point. And that difference in temperature, uh, 
and knowing how much power we're putting through the, the size of the sample and the temperature difference, we can calculate the thermal conductivity as it shows on the formula. So from that, I measured, I did a curve myself from those measurements. And I compared it to the known Tolkien samples. Uh, so if you go into Tolkien, into the literature, you'll find thermal conductivity of silicon. And he has a collection of various, um, many people's experiments and their results. So I looked for one that was of very similar properties to the silicon material that I had. So we looked for a similar uh, oxygen, boron, and a similar resistance, which is what I've put in the table. And if you look, uh, my curve and his curve are very similar. So we want to make sure that the peak peaks around the same temperature and it flattens out at the same uh, sort of lower part. The difference in height is dependent on things like the boron uh, density, how much oxygen, the resistivity. There's a lot of things that uh, will modify how high or how low your curve goes. But in this case, this is the closest approximation I could find to the material I had. So now that I had my thermal conductivity of silicon, I then went and bonded uh, samples with silicon. And in the middle, I had the bond, the HCB. So in the first picture that you see, it's a single bond. So you can see there's two pieces of like little pieces of silicon attached, and there's like a little line in the middle. So that's one bond. And then the picture in the middle has something similar, but there's 10 bonds. So in this case, instead of using a 5 by 5 by 20 connected to another one, we use two five by five by twenties at the very top and the bottom. And in between, we put in very small like disc of the same geometry uh, with the same cross sectional area as the silicon blocks, but much thinner in order to be able to do lots of bonds in between. So we stack them like burgers and we did 10 bonds. And then another sample that we did was take out the same blocks as the five by five by 20 and then put in four together, which gave us three bonds. So I measured all of these. And the reason for doing the multiple bonds of layers was because using a single bond, the effect on the bond is so, so small that we couldn't really measure a difference. So when measuring across the different temperatures and then calculating what the thermal conductivity of the bond would be, because the, the difference between that and the silicone was so negligible, we couldn't really get an accurate value. So by increasing how many bonds we had, we can then actually measure the thermal conductivity of the bond in the silicon. So this is this equation kind of shows you what I'm talking about. So the bond and the silicon, the thermal conductivity of the bond and thermal conductivity of the silicon give us the total thermal conductivity of the entire sample. So we extract the value of the thermal conductivity of the bond from all of this and gives us the, the equation at the very bottom. So it relates to all of them. So if you're if your bond and your if your total and your silicon are very similar, then your bond becomes impossible to measure. So, sorry, I should say, so using a mix of the three bonds, so the, the 10 and the three bonds, I measure them multiple times. Uh, I then plotted them and it gave me this really nice curve. So this is what I measured to be the thermal conductivity of the hydroxy catalysis bonds, where you can see it goes from about 10 Kelvin all the way to room temperature and it peaks around as 120 Kelvin or so, and then it flattens a bit, uh, which is a really nice curve. And I'm, yeah. From here, we can see, um, so I, I cannot say a bit more later, but this gives us that the value of the thermal conductivity is so low that it really won't have a large effect or any effect really on how much noise it goes into our system, which is what we want. We want to make sure that we can extract the heat and that it's not adding anything into our noise. Uh, so since Wei Chang Feng's here, I'm just gonna quickly, so I should, well, just quickly say this. So I measure also, we wanted to know whether the samples were strong or not. So I measured 40 samples and strength tested them just to see how strong the bonds were. And this is just how the samples are breaking on each. So these are the stresses that we have. So the blue, the red, and the yellow are just the different uh, weeks at which point they were broken from their bonding time and just the different types of breakages. Uh, I also did an FEA analysis just to see how the, using our silicon bonds, how the heat would transfer and be extracted. So I use a similar uh, um, measurements to what ETLF would be. So for the mass and the radius of the beam, 
applying a constant force and it just showed again as i was saying before that our because the thermal of the bond is so small we won't really see a big uh, influence and so our our test masses and our detectors are not really are not limited by the noise or by any effect coming from the bond so there's other things that are much that have a much higher impact like the coating and other things so from that point of view our thermal conductivity of silicon of the bonds with the silicon test mass should be fine and which is the last slide i think although it's not moving all right yeah i did a, a fast a quick fpa simulation for cooling down just to see how long it would take to cool down the test mass so having the very top where the red arrows are that's five kelvin so the very top and then our test mass is a normal temperature so using the 5k as a heat sink i did two models taking into account using our the the thermal conductivity of the bond that i got and having our suspension at 300 so that gave me the following plot which just shows that uh sorry so if you read it says taking the etlf concept design the heat sink temperature will be at 5k and operating temperature at 20k a fixed temperature of 5k is applied at the top uh, each fiber was the rest of the suspension is at 300. So the entire suspension stays at 300. And I did two models. So one where it's only cooled through conduction, which is our worst case scenario. And another one where we use conduction and radiation surrounding the entire uh, suspension at 5 Kelvin, which is the more likely uh, scenario that we'll have. And it just shows you how long it would take to cool down that test mass. So if we, the actual, the more likely one to be, which is where the, as you were using radiation and, and conduction, it would take about 35 and a half days to reach the 20 Kelvin. And if not, if we're only using the worst case scenario, it would take around 140 days to cool the test. Uh, but that's not the real, the real case, it's with radiation, what we're really looking into. And just a quick conclusion. So my experimental measurements for the thermal conductivity of the bonds between the silicon substrates uh, showed a thermal conductivity at 20 Kelvin, which is the interesting temperature of 0 0.05 watts per meter per Kelvin. And we have that for the 15K temperature difference between the mirror, which is the 20K and the marionette 5K, the, different, the additional difference in temperature associated with the silicon bond is 14.5 uh, micro Kelvin for a one PPM absorption, which is the ideal scenario. We also have that for a 120K test mass configuration. So looking really into Voyager, which probably will be at 120, we have that the, resistance of the bonds is really negligible compared to our suspension elements. So at 120, you don't really have to worry so much about the thermal conductivity of the bonds. And then, yeah, I think that's it. The other was just the my strength measurements and the FEM uh, simulations where I said that our, it would take about 35 and a half days to take the, the mass to the required temperature. And if you want to know about my results or all about my thesis, just if you look at the bottom part, there's my uh, my name with my title of my thesis, and you can find it online. I think that's it. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Mariela. You're welcome. Questions? I, I have two questions. Uh, Sorry. How heavy is the test mass? Sorry, I forgot. I should know. Uh, so the I forget because 40 kilograms is the current one, isn't it? Uh, it's like 300 or something. I forget. Uh, in a while. Really? Oh, okay. For ET, it's meant to, okay. I forget. It's very so. big. Yeah. Right. Because it's ETLF. So there's the two different ones. The yes, HF yes. is a smaller because it stays silica because yeah. it's higher temperature, but the LF is a much bigger uh, mass. My other question, if there are no other questions, is um, you said that you were very happy with the thermal conductivity curve of the bond and how it looks but why do you expect it to look that way so i should say it's 200 kilograms uh oh, 200 60 kilograms. centimeter 200 kilograms 60 centimeter diameter okay uh sorry and say that again that one yeah you said that you, you're very happy with that curve well, why do you expect it to look that way i i didn't quite catch that so there's no i, I didn't really expect it to look in any particular way you would expect there to be uh with thermal conductivity, you always expect it to go up and have a peak at certain temperature, which is the highest point, and then drops off. Uh, so it has that shape, which gives you the, if it was completely flat, 
there would be something wrong because you would expect it to curve up and then down. Uh, I see. Okay. Not like silicon because silicon is very like peaky and then down. But the fact that it has that shape uh, means that you are measuring, you probably are measuring thermal conductivity. And uh, so I, because I did averages, well, not really, I measured multiple times through the various samples mm -hmm. and they all gave me the same, roughly the same value. So that's why I'm saying I was very happy. And so this is just the, taking all of those values into account, uh, but they all follow the same, that same curve as it is there. Um, so, so and they're the, very, very low values as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, the low values are cool. Um, the, the, the experiments with the multiple bonds and the single bonds all gave sort of this trend. Is that, is that what you're saying as well? Yeah. So with the 10 okay. bond and the three bonds, yeah, hmm. gave me the same, it was the, so with the 10 bond, it was easier to see. So when you look at the thermal conductivity, so like I said before, I had to extract the value using this. So for the 10 bonds, then the difference between the silicon and the total was larger uh, because you would actually see, I, I didn't put any of the plots, but you could <coughs> actually see where the, so you would have like your silicon bond, like the blue, mm -hmm. the red one here, for example. Okay. And then you could see a bigger drop. So you would have the total So measuring the silicon with all the bonds, it would be somewhere like low here. So you could see a massive jump between like the silicon and the bond. I see. Uh, but once you start reducing the bonds, so using like the three one, then that curve starts getting closer. And then that becomes a danger, like like with the one bond, essentially they kind of overlap and then you can't really extract it. But with the three bonds, you can still have it like lower, close, but lower. Uh, so you could extract the value. Um, but yeah, all, so using the three bonds and the 10 bonds, you gave me, all of them gave me roughly this. And, and the geometry of the interface doesn't affect this measurement, right? So the, no, uh, because when you when you use that equation, you essentially the oh, all areas the A's come out. cancel out. Okay, cool. Okay. But the the area that we use, the cross-sectional area that we use, is um, comparable to the area of the ears. So five by five by forty is similar cross-section to the ears, which I can't remember exactly the numbers, but it is comparable to them. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I, I think Garvin wants to say something. Go ahead, Garvin. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Um, I'm just wondering, but why did you choose to have the bonds all separated for the free bond sample, uh, whereas for the 10 bonds, it seems like they were all next to each other? So, no. The, so for the 10 bonds, we essentially had a silicon disc, which was half a millimeter thick. Uh, so we just cut them to be the same size as the, as the stacks, that's what we call them. Um, so our experiment, our setup was a, a one size experiment. So it was about this big, my, where I could put my stuff. So we were limited by the size of where the experiment would sit. So our samples couldn't be too long because then they didn't really fit in the box and into the cryostat. Uh, so we're limited by how, how long a sample can be. The longest sample we could have was like that uh, sample with three bonds, which are four samples. So that's mm -hmm. as long as we could get it still fit into the experiment box. Um, so it was really all about size. Yeah. So when we did the 10 bond, we just used the slides to try and make as many bonds as we could. We actually started with 25 bonds, just as a random uh, number. We were trying to, not entirely random, we were trying to maximize the effect that we could see of the bond. Uh, and 25 was a very large number, which we thought we could attain. And so we went for that. But putting 25 bonds, so there's about nine out of 10 bonds gives you a good bond, a bad bond. So there's the possibility of it. So people that do the bonding, we practice a lot. So you, you, you become very good at it, but there's still a chance that out of 10 bonds, one, you get a bad bond. Uh, so when you're doing 25 bonds, there's the possibility that you have at least two bad bonds there. And having bad bonds means that you can have an air gap, a slightly thicker bond, which means that the strength of the bond is not as good and you could cause breakage. So when we did the 25 bonds, we were noticed that our samples were breaking. So they weren't, they weren't strong enough because obviously bonds were broken uh, or not well connected or there was an air gap or something. So we then reduced it to 10, hoping that even though it was still within the 10, nine, one might be bad. Uh, we thought, let's just have a go and see because we wanted to maximize how many bonds we could have. Uh, so we did four samples with 10 bonds, one broke, but three were perfect. 
So we use those three. And then we wanted to compare that to, so because it was a disk, it wasn't the exact same properties as the stacks from the bigger ones. We wanted to see what it would be if we use the same exact same material from the same ingot. Uh, so we had four samples left from the experiment. So we thought, let's just put them together. And that's as, as, as long as a sample that we can actually fit. So let's just use them three, the four, and see what happens. So we put them together and it worked. So we measure them. Right. So I, I, I guess my question should be worded slightly differently. Um, for the free bond one, why, why didn't you just stick two of the, the blocks together with free bonds in the middle? It, it, rather than having like what looks like four blocks with one in between each one? Say that again. So why didn't you put two and yeah? So, so do you see how the ten bond one? It, it, it seems like there's two two blocks stuck together with like ten ten bonds in the middle. Yeah. Whereas for free bonds, you have four blocks with with one bond in each. Yep. Yeah. So why didn't you do two blocks so it's consistent with the others, and then uh, have three bonds in the middle? So it doesn't it doesn't matter where the bond is. Uh, right. in the stack so we're, look, so we're measuring so for example in this case for the can you see my arrow when i'm yes trying to, yeah. okay good so in here like we would have uh we had four thermometers measuring across the sample so we would always have one like here close to the bond one here close to the bond and one as the farthest possible and in this case we had them in like sequences so we had one here one here, one here, and one here. So we then would be able to measure across three bonds, across two bonds, and across two across two two bonds, okay. one across three bonds, and one across one bond. So we actually had a lot more that we could measure on the larger samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then that we could compare. So we would compare the three bonds and the two two bonds to make sure that what we were seeing was sensible. Obviously, like I said, with one bond, there's nothing really that you can see. Uh, but we use the two two bonds and the three bonds and the three bonds obviously gave you the larger gap between the peak uh, so it was a, a more accurate but we use all three to compare essentially right okay uh, that makes a lot more sense yeah so it was just practicality uh, and you want to make sure that your bonds are thin as well so that's also a key thing so you want to make sure that you try uh, however arrangement you have that your bonds are very thin which if you have uh, Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Uh, if not, then thanks, Mariano. Uh, I guess we should move on to the next speaker, uh, Wei Changfeng. Wei Changfeng, are you here? Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for Mariano's talking. Uh, <laughs> I'm Wei Changfeng from Beijing Normal University. Uh, can I start now? Yes, please go yeah. ahead. Okay. You should be able to share. Hopefully, if not, let me just make sure. Um, yes, so first, I, I want to apologize for my late because just now I was uh, figuring out. Uh, figuring a BSN sampler problem and this meeting just fell out of my mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so today I will introduce my recent work, uh, the detection of black hole encounter gravitational waves using binary black holes template. Uh, so I, I will follow this orders First, I will introduce black holes encounter, and then I will introduce how to use Minke uh, Python library to produce a large scale of uh, signals, and then use Vitme a machine learning network to search the black hole encounter signals. And we can hear, yes. Uh, you can hear me. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, finally. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I will continue. Uh, so our work is to try to use BBH template to make parameter estimation on BH encounter. And we 
find the from the vitamins output posteriors, we find the BBH like posterior. And these posterior are from you know BH encounter signals. And then we select these BH encounter signals to make parameter estimation with PLV uh, using spinning and non-spinning BBH templates respectively. So first, uh, black hole encounter is, uh, uh, it happens in globular clusters and the centers of galaxies. And uh, when the energy radiated by gravitational waves is greater, the, greater than the initial orbital energy. Uh, the most the most of GW events observed by LIGO and Virgo are circularized BBH, which means the or, the orbit is already get circularized between uh, before the frequency enters the LIGO span. Because the in a BBH system, the loss uh, the orbital energy is already lost in the long in spiral phase. And, but for beach counter signals, it lacks a long in spiral phase. This is their difference. So beach encounter have a, has a high eccentricity. And it are, it's also related to the uh, mechanism formation process of the binary system. For uh, There are two types of formation process for a binary. The first is an isolate binary, which called, uh, uh, which called field, a field binary. That means the binary system already exists be before the, the star Com becomes a compact object. And then the, the other is dynamical formation, which refers to this case. So two black hole encounters and uh, they are, there is a gravitational radiation capture. And then if the energy radiated by gravitational waves greater than the initial orbital energy, as I said, they will merge. Okay, so so we also know from this, the black hole encounter waveform has two types. One is the merger ones, the, the other is non-merger. Okay, so then we use Minke to inject black hole encounter. Uh, Wei Xiangfeng, sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened to your share screen, but we are stuck on one slide only. Uh, it's no longer oh. full full screen for us here. Oh, so what about now? Uh, well, it's not in presentation mode. Okay, now we can see it. Yes, but it's not in presentation mode. I don't know. If, okay. If you, yeah. I mean, like this is fine as well. So yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Th thanks for reminding. So, so next we inject black hole encounter waveform. Uh, the waveform is from Korean scientist and. It adopts a parabolic approximation, and uh, it's available for non-spinning pairs of black holes, and the relative relative velocity up to ten to twenty percent of the speed of light. And we pick up the merger ones to inject. This is to this is because we want to the. BH encounter signals to mimic binary black holes. So we have to pick the merger ones. And there are five kinds of mass ratio for this waveform, which which are one, two, four, eight, and the 16. So five mass ratio. We, uh, for each waveform, we inject 100, we, we inject 100 parameters. So we got 500 signals. And the, the way to inject parameters is showed in the right 
uh, table. Uh, so let's say the injection parameters table. So first, the total mass, we fix it at 150 solar mass. Because, you know, uh, this is a good mass to, it's similar to a high mass BBH. So because we want to mimic high mass BBH, we have to have a similar total mass. Then we will have a similar frequency, right? And also there is a GW event, uh, GW19, uh, that is a high mass BBH event and its total mass is just 150 solar mass. So that's why we do this. And for the distance, it's different for each waveform because we want to, we want its posterior looks similar to high mass BBH. So we adjust the distance very flexibly. And the sky location is generated in a uniform, in a random uniform prior. As we can see, the injection parameters includes total mass, luminosity distance, and the uh, red ascension, declination, and the sky. So the distribution of locations can be specific, specified easily by Minky, because it means Minky is designed to produce this kind of large scale of signals. So, so uh, now we have 500 signals and we inject this waveform with these signals to Vitamin. Vitamin is a machine learning network trained on binary black holes template. It's, it's used to search binary black hole, but now we inject, now we input beach encounter inside. And the advantage of Vitamin compared to Bilby is it, it run really fast. So a typical analysis with Bilby in this study for one signal is like two to three days. And Vitamin just needs 10 to 20 seconds to produce the posterior sample. So it really do fast. And we, here we can see the prior of Vitamin. It's, it's based on a non-spinning BBH template, so there's no spin prior. And the and uh, sky and the there are also two parameters um, modulized. So finally, uh, 15 parameter, 15 parameters minus six spin parameters minus two modulized parameters. We finally have seven parameters to estimate. And the prior is trained uh, with a long time, but once the network gets trained, then we are, then it just takes less time to produce posterior. Okay, so the vitamin search is to find the BH encounters whose posteriors appear similar to high mass DBH. First, I will show how high mass DBH posterior, posterior looks like. This is a typical high mass DBH. The, the M1 and M2 is like seven, 70 solar mass to 80 solar mass. And as, as you can see, vitamin, uh, with me has a kind of accurate output for the signal. And then I will show some non BBH like posteriors. So th this is from the BH encounter signals, but because we use the raw model, so for most of posteriors of the BH encounter, they are non BBH like posteriors because run model, right? As you can say, some of the parameters, you cannot find a peak or hunt. So, so Vitamin don't know what the signal is. And 
also, luckily, we have some good posteriors, which is BBH like. So this is from beach encounter signals, but we may think it's a BBH signal. As you can see, it's even better than the real BBH posterior. So this is the result we want, we expect. And uh, we also calculate how many good posteriors, how, that is BBH-like signals uh, compared to the total sample. As we mentioned, for each waveform, we have 100 samples. And here we show the, the fraction. And then we select, for each waveform, we select at least one good signal. That means we select their injection parameters, the sky location, right? The total mass is fixed and the distance for one waveform is fixed. So we just select the their sky location and uh, and here we, we show their injection parameters. As you can see, we, we select six signals for mass ratio, of, uh, mass ratio of one, we select two signals. And the optimal SNR are calculated in the red column. Then we use BBH template to make a real parameter estimation with Bilby on, the, on these encounter signals. First, uh, first uh, just like what I show the vitamin to you, I want to show the BBH posterior, a, a typical BBH posterior using BBH template. So uh, all the posteriors are, are turned on the time and phase modularization. The left plot is a non-spinning model and the right, po right plot is a spinning model. So this is a typical BBH posterior which analysis on BBH signals. And then we move to the BH encounters performance. Uh, this is still a BBH posterior on BBH signals just without time and phase visualizations. Okay, so let's see how BH encounters perform on Bilby. Uh, we select three signals. Uh, at, at, actually, we make tests for all the six signals I show you in that table. But here we just show three plus First is the number two signal. I, I will go a quick flashback. So there are six signals and I give their number. As, can you see this? And, and I select a uh, number two signal to analysis by non-spinning model. We use IMR phenom PV2, which is uh, supported widely by the pattern package. And uh, the Bilby sh also shows a good result. It's very like a BBH posterior. And we also use spinning model and it performs good too. Uh, so, so actually, so I, I do this to all these six signals, but here we just show one signal's performance on non-spinning and spinning model respectively. Yeah. And and here we show the bias of BH encounters parameters using BBH model for Bayesian inference. As you can say, let's say the first column, the M1. So the left side uh, for number two signal, 75 is its injected value to a BH encounter waveform. And the second column, 
0.23 is the uh, maximum of, of posterior from non spinning model. And then the, 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 the third value is the spinning model's maximum. So here we show all the parameters. And then we calculate the log Bayes factor for, uh, as you can see, uh, co compared to the new hypothesis, hypothesis how the non-spinning model and the spinning model space factor like, and the spinning model compared to non-spinning model. And finally, we use, we use the maximum of encounters posterior to inject a BBH template. That is, uh, can you see the, uh, th this posterior, right? This is used non spinning model and we can get maximum from this. And we, we, uh, we, we, we know the, these maximums and we inject these parameters to a BBH model. And then we get our time domain signals. Then we compare the time domain signals with the original BH encounters and the compare it. Yeah. So here we say the figure 11 in the left for the left plot, the right line, the right curve is, oh, sorry, the black curve is the original B black hole encounter signals. And the not and the right lock, the right curve and the blue curve is the spinning BBH and the non-spinning BBH. Note that red curve and blue curve are all BBH signals. They are just using maximum of BH encounters posterior. And we can say spinning BBH model, uh, model the data better. Yes, so here are three plots. Uh, they are for number three, number number two, number three, and the number six signals respectively. Yeah, and, and in the future, this this study can be extended to the better model, MR phenom XHM. And, and here, it is, here is the appendix uh, shows the BSN inference information we use the density sampler and samples is like 25,000 and endpoint is 1,000. And here we also show the BOB's prior for both spinning and non-spinning models. It's a little bit wider than the weight means because we want to get a, a more accurate estimation. Yeah, so we just show one signals posterior bef before. So here is the other two, the number three signals posterior, but this doesn't look very good. Doesn't look like a typical BBH. This is signal six. Yes, uh, that's all. Uh, thank you, very helpful. Questions for Wei Thanks. I have a question. Yes. How long does it normally take to like, I'm guessing you get like a sample of data, a set number. How long does it take to normally to run through it and get or search for a signal in it? Uh, sorry. How long does it take you to run? Oh what you do like on average how long to analysis uh, analysis the data yes that's right uh for vitamin it's from 10 to 20 seconds and for bilby it's like uh two to three hours but, uh, wait, but now sorry sorry which one you should mention i think i'm not sure you mentioned vitamin is based on some uh machine learning approach 
Did you mention that? I, I don't remember seeing uh, it. You, yes, I just said that uh, Readme is a machine learning network trained on BBH template. Oh, okay. Sorry, yes. Yeah, so Readme is not real uh, Bayesian inference. It's a machine learning network. Uh, yeah, it's machine learning, but it's trained to look like Bayesian, uh, to approximate Bayesian. Um, yes. Very quick, very quickly. So that's why it's very fast. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a question as well. Yes. Um. So, um, I, I may have missed it, but what are the general differences between spinning and, and non-spinning? Um. Uh, sources like did, did you notice a, a general pattern in in your results? Uh, uh no. So I, I don't I don't see that. So that, that's a good question. So spinning model and non spinning model, the difference between them. Hmm. Uh, so uh, generally we adopt uh here, the model's name is I am R P binom P V two. It's the uh, this is the model, and this is a spinning model. And if we set the six spin spin parameters as zeros, then that's a non-spinning model. Okay, yeah. I should explain this uh, maybe clearly. Thanks. Yeah. So, so are you saying that if you have a signal which looks like um, a non-spinning uh, black hole, then you can model it exactly the same, but with a spinning black hole, just with slightly different parameters. Uh, are you saying that there's a degeneracy, uh, like both signals can look the same? Uh, uh, so, sorry, I don't yeah, understand. It's okay. Um, uh, okay, so, so you found that there was no difference between the spinning black hole model and and the non-spinning black hole model. Uh, so during the analysis and the during the results. Yeah. So there, there are some differences. Like, of course, the spinning models analysis will take a lot of time because mm -hmm. they have more parameters. And the spinning model, uh, as we show in the log BS, BS factor here, Mm -hmm. Can you see the slide now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so the uh, the spinning model is uh, model the data better in the previous test. Yeah, it models the data better. Okay. So, so if you go to slide seventeen, the, the next slide. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I, I can see that the blue and the red, uh, they, they look different. Um. So uh, I don't know, is it true that in general that the spinning waveform um, has smaller amplitudes than the non-spinning waveform? Is that a general thing? Uh, so you mean the right, the amplitude of red and blue curve is smaller than the black one? No, no I'm saying the, the red is smaller than the blue. Is that general? Oh, I, I don't say the red is smaller than blue. Oh. Yeah. For this one, yeah, it, it's kind of smaller. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if this is general. Okay. okay, yeah, so you can see for this one, it's the amplitude is similar. Mm -hmm. uh, Gavin, those plots are a function of the um, estimated distance, so that the estimated distance will change the amplitude, right? So uh, maybe in this case, it somehow thinks that the estimated distance for the non-spinning binary black BBH model is nearer, slightly nearer than for the spinning model. Um, yeah. So, so the, yeah. there's always going to be some other parameters which you can change, which can alter how these um, waveforms will look. Uh, yeah, and, and actually the, the spinning waveform has more models, sorry, has more parameters. So uh, there's a chance that if you give it something that is not a binary black hole uh, merger, then the, the spinning model could fit it better because it has more parameters to sort of, yeah, yes. adjust right. itself. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I also want to mention uh, in the uh, 
the test now, during the present test, the distance is not, the estimated distance is not very stable. So if you, you make the parameter estimation with the totally same, no, same signal and the same noise, the distance will change a lot, the estimate distance. So I'm still trying to make these results uh, stable, maybe increasing the MCMC numbers. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any final questions from anyone? Uh, if not, then so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is maybe a slightly chaotic start to a series of uh, PhD student talks, but I hope uh, we will have uh, more volunteers for, from PhD students or uh, well, people who are not PhD students oh. encourage PhD students to attend um, and, and give talks in the future. Uh, Wei Changfeng, yes? So, so today's meeting is just for, for, for me. I think every audience will come and, and we make a uh, presentation. Well, uh, no, no, this is, uh, yeah, that's okay. So the, today there were meant to be two speakers, but one speaker was ill. So he was, he's unwell and not, hasn't, was, was not able to, to talk. Oh, so, then I will thank Mariela again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, uh, but to, hopefully in two weeks time, we will have other speakers. Please um, encourage your friends uh, who are PhD students uh, to give to to volunteer to give talks? I think it'll be interesting to hear the research from all all the, all the students. Uh, okay. Any questions, comments, Mar Mariella? Do you want to say anything? I think I mean I think you've said it all. I think if you can encourage others or yourself and your team and your group to come and join our webinar, uh, that would be great. I'm still taking notes and names uh, for anyone who wants to do them. Sorry, I'm, my camera's off because. Uh, both my husband and I are on call, so we're both kind of sharing our son. Uh, so my video's off. So I apologize for that. Uh, but also thank you for coming today. And as you said, sorry for the slightly chaotic uh, starting to the student se seminar series. But hopefully it was okay and you enjoyed learning about thermal conductivities unexpectedly. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you again in two weeks. And I'll be emailing you very soon with the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank so. You. Hopefully see you in two weeks time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.